Welcome to this week's edition of Micro Seminar. We're glad you can join us. Um, we hope everybody out there is, is, is handling things, are, are handling everything okay. You guys are happy, healthy, and safe if possible. And uh, we're really excited to provide you with a, another, another edition of some fabulous microbiology to, to round out the week. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ella Shiratsky. Um, she is a postdoc at UC Berkeley, uh, one of my favorite places on the planet, uh, in, in Mary Firestone's lab. And you're going to be hearing a lot about her work today uh, uh, in, in, in that lab. Uh, a little bit about her background. She has a BS and a master's degree from uh, Tel Aviv University. Her BS was in biology and her master's degree was in marine ecology, uh, working on microbes with, of marine sponges. She then went to do a PhD at USC, uh, where I am now with the great Jed Furman, who I share a wall with. <laughs> and uh, I missed Ella by just like uh, chips passing in the night. I, um, but uh, I'm very happy to know that she's at UC Berkeley in, and uh, moving on with the, with the great Mary Firestone. So I'm going to let her tell you all about it and hand it over to her now. So without any further ado, Ella, take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you. Um, I'm honored to be here and I am a little nervous. So uh, be, you know, be patient. All right. Um, let me share my screen. And there we go. So um, today I'm going to present some of the research that I've been doing in Mary Firestone's lab. Uh, this isn't published yet, but very close to being submitted. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to present it here. I was going to present it at ISME in the summer, which sadly isn't happening. Um, but this is as close as it gets, and um, I hope you enjoy it. So as Cameron said, I started out in marine systems and I had a pretty good picture in my head of what it's like to be a marine microbe. You know, where do you get your food? Who are your friends? Who are your enemies? How do you move around? And then I switched to soil systems and I realized that I don't have that picture in my head. And since I don't know if all of you are soil scientists, I assume not, um, I'm going to try to give you at least broad strokes of what it's like to be a microbe in soil. Um, so I specifically work on grassland soils in Mediterranean climates, which are very common around the world. And these grassland soils are uh, dominated by annual grasses. And annual grasses are really fun because they grow each year and then they die over the summer. So you have a very tractable experimental system that you can run experiments on year after year after year. Um, this is not agricultural soil, so it's not fertilized, whatever uh, inputs of carbon and nitrogen are only gonna be whatever plants can produce or that comes in, in through natural inputs. Soil is really, really patchy and whether or not you can move around or access nutrients depends on whether there's water in there. So summer is really difficult in Mediterranean soils um, and then winter's a little, easier, but also can get flooded. So there are a lot of challenges and there are a lot of changes in the environment. Um, the microbial community in soils is extremely diverse. If you've ever tried to assemble genomes from soil metagenomes, you know that it's incredibly hard. If you can map 10% of your reads to those genomes, you basically do a little happy dance. Um, and then finally, there is a big difference whether you're living in what we call bulk soil or if you're living near plant roots. And I'm gonna talk about that later. If you're living in bulk soil, it's a really hard life. There's not a lot of carbon sources or nitrogen sources around. And whatever organic sources there are, um, are pretty likely to be absorbed to minerals, which makes them almost inaccessible. So it's a hard, hard life. Today, I'm gonna focus on the nitrogen cycle. And so, of course, I have to have the token nitrogen cycle uh, figure here. And 
I guess the point that I want to make is that for each one of the steps or each one of the transformations in this cycle, there are marker genes that we can use to detect whether there's at least gene expression of these transformations or not. So are the microbes, I don't want to say, are they actually performing this transformation, but are they at least thinking about it? So are they taking their genomic potential to do it and at least giving it a try? I'm gonna focus, so this is all based on metatranscriptomes, everything that I'm gonna to present today. And so based on what I found in those metatranscriptomes, I'm gonna focus on these transformations, ammonia oxidation, modification, and um, assimilation of, um, of ammonium. All right. So I told you a little bit about what it's like to be a microbe in soil. What about plants? So plants uh, can mainly take up nitrogen in the form of inorganic nitrogen, so ammonium or nitrate or nitrite. Um, or they can take up small organic nitrogen molecules like amino acids. Um, it's unclear whether they can actually use larger organic molecules. But unfortunately, most of the nitrogen in soil is actually packed up in macromolecules like proteins and chitin. Um, and it's generally thought that because this is the case, the rate limiting step in nitrogen acquisition by plants is that transition from high molecular weight pro, uh, nitrogen to low molecular weight by proteases or chitinases. And the plant doesn't do that. But this is where soil bacteria come to the rescue. So there are soil bacteria that live in the area right around the plant roots. That area that's about three millimeters from the root is called a rhizosphere. And the microbes that live there, in theory, can mineralize these large organic molecules that contain nitrogen which could benefit the plant um, that would take up this mineralized nitrogen. So this is why we care about rhizosphere bacteria. Um, I've already hinted towards this before, but I'll explain it more broadly now. Life in the rhizosphere is very different from life in bulk soil. In bulk soil, you're basically living in the fruits and vegetables section of the supermarket. Um, all of your carbon and nitrogen sources are hard to degrade, hard to get, and you don't get a lot of nutrients from them in the end. Whereas in the rhizosphere, the plant roots actually exude sugars and also small organic nitrogen molecules that are very labile and very easy to take up. For that reason, the microbial community in the rhizosphere is very different from that in bulk soil. And microbes are attracted to this, to these root exudates. Um, so it's basically like living in the uh, uh, deli section of the supermarket. And as a result of that, the biomass uh, around rhizosphere or in the rhizosphere is higher per gram soil than in bulk soil. Okay. The plant that we're gonna, that I'm gonna present today is just wild oat. It's one of the most common plants in California. It dominates the California Mediterranean grasslands or actually Mediterranean grasslands around the world. It, actually, it came originally from the Mediterranean a few hundred years ago, but it's very established in California now. Um, the soil or the field site where we get our soil is in Hopland, California in the Hopland Research and Extension Center where Avena has been growing for many years, there are two main species, Avena fatua and Avena barbata. Today I'm gonna to talk about Avena fatua, um, which has a slightly shorter lifespan. But the main point that I want you to take from this is we're using soil that Avena, that is very adapted to having Avena in it. So the microbial community is adapted to being recruited to the Avena rhizosphere. This is a stable system. It's not like transplanting corn or wheat into soil that has never grown corn or wheat. We have the right types of microbes. 
and we're using um, them in the microcosm experiments. So in theory, the microbial assembly that's gonna grow in the rhizosphere of Avena in the greenhouse or in the microcosm should be a good representation of what we would see in the field. All right. Um, so this is a pretty good model system and we have a lot of experiments running on it. The experiment that I'm gonna talk about today was run by Dr. Aaron Nuccio, um, who used to be at Mary Firestone's lab and is currently at the Livermore, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And she's graciously let me use her data to look at nitrogen cycling. So here's how it worked. Um, Dr. Nuccio built, my, built microcosms um, pack them with soil from hopland and put seeds of Avena, Avena fatua in them. She let the plant grow for about six weeks. So we're dealing with a plant that's about, when we start the experiment, about halfway through its lifespan. It's an adult plant. And the cosms are built so that there is a sidecar. Um, and the sidecar is closed for the first six weeks. The nice thing about this sidecar is it's very thin and transparent. So you can actually see the root going, growing through it. So you can track the root and say, you know, this is where it's, it is after three days. This is where it is after six days. This is after where it is after 12 days, 22 days. So it's a, actually a very precise time series of rhizosphere aging. And the reason this is interesting is because as rhizosphere ages, it potentially becomes more nitrogen limited. And so whatever bacteria are in there would have to find other sources because plant roots that are aging don't exude as much nitrogen as young roots. So these microbes would have to find other sources of nitrogen. So we're growing the plant for six weeks in the microcosms and then after six weeks open the sidecar and then roots can start growing into it and be tracked over time. We had four treatment groups here. One of them just had bulk soil with no plant at all. Uh, another group had bulk soil with plant litter. So those are old roots that have been dried and represent you know, kind of roots of plants that have died and now serve as a source of carbon, or that's how we think of them anyway. So we have bulk soil without litter and bulk soil with litter. And then we have the same thing with plants. So we have rhizosphere soil with litter or without litter. So four groups, four time points, three replicates. All in all, there were 48 microcosms and for each one of them, we sequence soil metatranscriptomes. Before I go into my own research, I just wanna point out that there have already been two papers published from this data set, which is a beautiful data set. Um, the first one was uh, by a brilliant graduate student, now Dr. Evan Starr, who used these metatranscriptomes to look at RNA viruses in soil. Uh, it's a really cool paper and I highly encourage you to find it, it's been published in PNAS last year. And then Dr. Erin uh, published um, a paper based on the same data set, looking at the expression of carbohydrate active enzymes or casimes. This has been published this year in ISME Journal. And I'm gonna mention it a little bit later. Okay, so now I have these 48 metatranscriptomes. What do I do with them? I took two main approaches um, to look at what's being transcribed. The first one is I assemble the metatranscriptomes. And what assembling metatranscriptomes gives you is it gives you open reading frames or ORFs of genes that are actually being expressed in the system. And then you can do two things with them. One is you can use HMMs to identify nitrogen cycling ORFs. And I used both HMMs from KEG, so basically just looking at the entire nitrogen cycling uh, diagram in KEG and taking all the genes in it. And then I added on top of that 
uh, extracellular proteases, which can access all that macromolecular nitrogen in soil. And since there are not, no good HMMs for extracellular proteases, um, I used a data set that was published in 2019 um, by Nguyen et al. I'm gonna go back to that paper later. Um, and they basically took the Merops database, for those of you who know it, um, and found all the bacterial extracellular proteases out of that. So I just used that with reciprocal blast against my ORFs to identify extracellular proteases. And then I recruited reads to all of these genes of interest. So I could tell which ones of them are being expressed and how highly they're being expressed. So that's one approach. The second approach is the approach that Dr. Nuccio took in her study, which is to take those metatranscriptomic reads and map them to a collection of draft genomes that we have from the same soil. And this collection is made out of uh, metagenomic assembled genomes, MAGs, um, from some single cell genomes, some isolates, and also from MAGs that came from a stable isotope probing study. And these were actually the ones that recruited the most reads. But all of these were from the same soil. So it's a meta-metagenome. Um, and on average, it recruited about 12% of the reads, which as I told you in soil is you know, decent. Um, and then you can throw that information into DESeq2, which is an R program, um, and pinpoint genes in specific genomes that are being differentially expressed, whether they're upregulated or downregulated. Okay, so those are the two experimental approaches. This is the approach, like I said, that Dr. Nuccio took. So let's take a look at what she found. Um, so what we have here, just to orient you, is we're comparing differential, ex to, compare, to get differential expression, we're comparing treatment groups to the control, which is bulk soil with no litter. So we can see what um, genes are being differentially expressed in rhizosphere soil without litter, rhizosphere soil with litter, and bulk soil with litter. For each one of these groups on the bottom, we have the time series, and then on the right here, we have the reference genomes that recruited or had upregulated uh, genes. And this is a heat map that's based on expression of casines. So when you look at this heat map and you use hierarchical clustering on it, it results in um, three main guilds, functional guilds. So these are organisms that are doing similar things that are upregulating Chasms under similar conditions. We have a rhizosphere guild. So these are bugs that upregulate chasms in the presence of roots. We have a detritosphere guild. So these are bugs that upregulate chasms in the presence of litter, regardless of whether there are roots in there. And interestingly, we also have an aging root guild. And an aging root guild is a guild in which those bugs upregulate chasms in the presence of an older root. So only in the last time point after 22 days. And this is interesting because after 22 days, we can already tell because the cosm is transparent that the roots are getting yellow, which means they're beginning to senesce. And that means that they're actually becoming a potential target for degradation. It's kind of like adding a new batch of litter to the experiment. All right, so Aaron found these functional guilds and we're gonna get back to them later. And now I'm gonna go into my results. So the first thing that I wanted to get was sort of a bird's eye view of, do we even see difference in expression of nitrogen cycling genes in these different groups? So bulk soil with or without litter, rhizosphere with or without litter? And if so, which pathways are actually highly expressed and which ones are not. So let's start with the big picture. The first thing that pops at me is you can definitely see a difference between rhizosphere bacteria 
and the nitrogen cycling gene expression versus bulk soil bacteria. So full symbols versus empty symbols. And that's for the first three time points. When you dig deeper into that, there are actually very, there's a clear separation between um, groups that had litter addition versus ones that did not. So squares versus circles. But that's all in the first three time points. Once you get to the last time point, you can still differentiate easily between rhizosphere nitrogen gene expression versus bulk soil, but you, can, you don't see that effect of litter addition anymore. And that's probably for the same reason that I already mentioned that the roots were getting older and becoming a target for degradation. So that was the general view. Now let's look at what's being highly expressed. So this is a heat map of the normalized, or the coverage of nitrogen cycling genes that are don't, uh, basically represented in each row versus or normalized to the expression of housekeeping gene GERBY, which is a gyrase. Um, and the reason that I'm normalizing to a uh, housekeeping gene is because we have replicates and we have different groups and you could have a different number of organisms that are active in each of these cosms. So I didn't want that to, cre to create all sorts of artifacts um, as far as gene expression and what we can discern from it. All right. And what we're seeing here for each one of these cells is that normalized expression per gene, per group, per time point. And what I'm representing here is the actual sum of the expressions. So imagine the entire microbial community is just one organism, and I'm just summing up the coverage of all of these organisms, pretending they're just one thing. And I realize that that's not, uh, well, there could be criticism um, against that, but I'm only doing this to kind of pinpoint what's interesting. So let's start looking at what's being highly expressed. First, we see extracellular proteases within the extracellular um, molecular, macromolecular nitrogen degradation here on the right. And that seems to be happening pretty much everywhere. Then we have the next pathway is ammonium assimilation versus glutamate dehydrogenase or glutamate synthase, GSGO gap. And the only gene that's being highly expressed here is GLNA, which is the first step of the process. Now, this was kind of a surprise to me because I'm seeing pretty high expression and I know it's kind of hard to see here, but believe me, it's highly expressed compared to the rest of the genes that we'll look at later. Um, this is NIRK. NIRK is a step in denitrification. And I wasn't really expecting to find denitrification here because this is a very aerobic system and um, it just didn't seem to make much sense, but it turned into a really cool story. So I just wanted to point it out. Then we have these three subunits of ammonia monooxygenase, which oxidizes ammonium to nitrite. And finally, GLNB, which is a regulatory protein, that responds to nitrogen limitation and activates this ammonium assimilation pathway, GSGOGAT. So those are the highly expressed genes within pathways. Um, and as important as it is to see what's there, it's also really important to see what's not there. I did not see any recruitment to Animox, which is pretty expected. Um, but also no nitrogen fixation at all. Okay, so these were the highly expressed pathways, um, but like me, some of you might have favorite pathways or favorite transformations that don't appear here. So let's dig into those. Um, and what I'd like to point out is because the expression here is very high, I can actually say that there is a sig statistically significant difference in the progression over time of gene expression in all of these groups. 
but I can't say it for the low expression groups because the expression is low. So here are the other pathways or everyone's favorite pathways. Um, so we can take a look at some uh, less highly expressed transformations. So first we have ammonium assimilation. I told you that the first step, step was really highly expressed, but actually the rest of them, if you look at the scale bar, um, the previous scale bar went from zero to 500. Now we're looking at zero to five. So it's a difference of two orders of magnitude. Um, and we are seeing that there is some good B, which is glutamate dehydrogenase and expression of other genes in the GS GOGAT pathway. Next, we have um, assimilatory nitrate reduction, uh, which seems to be happening more in the rhizosphere. Uh, but again, this is not statistically significant because the expression is very low. Then we have denitrification, and we do see expression of the first step in denitrification, all of these, its three subunits, uh, NAR-GHI, mostly in bulk soil. Um, and I told you that we had near K, but there is a grain of salt there. And then we don't have any of the next steps. So as far as I'm concerned, I cannot say that denitrification is happening in this system. Um, and finally, we have dissimilatory nitrate reduction or DNRA, which is also has very low expression and is kind of sporadic. Um, so those were the other pathways. And now I'm gonna start digging into the highly expressed pathways to see what else I can tell you about them. And there are a couple of good stories in there. And I'm gonna start with nitrification. I told you that, um, so nitrification goes from ammonia to hydroxylamine through ammonia oxidation um, with the ammonia monooxygenase, ammo ABC. From hydroxylamine, the, pr the protein hydroxylamine oxidoreductase or HAO takes hydroxylamine to nitrite and then nitrite oxidoreductase or NXRAB goes from nitrite to nitrate. That's in ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Now, I was really excited about seeing some ammonia, ammonia oxidation because um, I've worked on this a little bit before. And I know that it can be done by both archaea and bacteria. And actually in the ocean, it's more commonly done by archaea. So I figured, you know, MOA is actually a phylogenetic marker gene. Let's throw it onto a phylogenetic tree of MOA and see which ones, or is it ammonia oxidizing archaea or bacteria who are actually expressing all this MOA? And what I found was really surprising. So this is that phylogenetic tree of MOA using reference sequences from RefSeq. This pink group here represents archaea. The blue group is bacteria. And we have the uh, Comamox clades here. And the bars represent the cumulative expression over all of the samples. So what's really striking here is that archaea are doing everything pretty much, all of the ammonia oxidation. And more than that, it's dominated by just three phylotypes, which is really cool. Um, so this phylotype that the arrow is pointing to is responsible for 88% of the expression of MOA. And if you add those two other phylotypes here, you get to 97% of the MOA transcripts. So I thought, okay, cool, but what if ammonia oxidizing archaea are just a lot more abundant than ammonia oxidizing bacteria? Maybe that explains why um, they express so much more MOA. So I looked at the 16S data that we have for the same study. And what we have here is the time over the x-axis and the relative abundance of ammonia oxidizing archaea in dark blue versus ammonia oxidizing bacteria in light blue. And it's true that ammonia oxidizing archaea are always four to five fold more abundant than the bacteria. They're still pretty rare. We're, they're never above 0.6% uh, of the community. 
And anyway, what we're looking at as far in terms of expression um, is orders of magnitude difference in expression of MOA. So I can't say that a several fold difference in abundance can explain such a high difference in expression of MOA. So these archaea are happy. They are ramping up their ammonia oxidation. Now we know from previous studies from published genomes of ammonia oxidizing archaea that they actually lack this HAO gene, the hydroxylamine oxidoreductase. And indeed, I'm not seeing almost any expression of that gene. So that makes sense. But what surprised me was that I'm not seeing expression of the next step of nitrite oxidation and XRAB, which was kind of odd. So, because it's considered in other systems at least that if you get, once you start with ammonia oxidation, you go all the way to nitrate. There's no stopping along the way. And then I presented this data and someone told me, did you know that ammonia oxidizing archaea actually use an analog to near K um, in their nitrification process. So they don't necessarily go to nitrate, they might go nitrite and then nitric oxide, like denitrification. We don't really know how exactly that happens. Um, there are a lot of labs, I think, or at least a few labs working on identifying an analog to hydroxylamine oxidoreductase in archaea and trying to figure out the role of near K. But for now, I just thought, you know, I have near K uh, sequences. Why don't I do the same thing that I did with the MOA and throw them onto a phylogenetic tree and look at the expression to see where it's coming from? So I did that and voila, um, that once again, we have the pin group here that represents archaea and almost all of the expression of near K seems to come from archaea. So I guess that's what's happening. So it, it looks like the dominant nitrification process here is the archaeal nitrification that potentially goes to nitric oxide. All right, that was nitrification. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about, or a lot a bit, about macromolecular nitrogen um, because that's the main nitrogen source in soil. So let's start with extracellular proteases. If I take that bird's eye view table that I showed you before, I take only the row that shows expression of extracellular proteases and turn it into box plots based on my replicates. This is what it's gonna look like. So we have the timeline or the time series on the x-axis, that normalized expression on the y-axis. And then we have the different treatment groups. So we have bulk soil with litter amendment in dark blue, bulk soil with no litter in light blue, rhizosphere with litter in dark purple, and rhizosphere without litter in light purple. So there are a couple of trends that, that pop up when you look at this. Um, first of all, that expression of extracellular proteases is highest in bulk soil with no litter which is kind of weird because if there's no substrate, why are they ramping up extracellular protease expression? Um, so there are a couple of explanations that I came up with for that. One of them is that what drives extracellular, extracellular protease expression in this system is not the presence of substrate, but actually the lack of end products, which are inorganic nitrogen. The other explanation potentially is that in bulk soil with no litter addition, most of the proteins are um, bound or adsorbed to minerals, and therefore they're a lot harder to access. And that's why the uh, they have to express a lot more extracellular proteases, those bacteria. Um, that being said, um, this is work in progress, and I'm very open to ideas and suggestions about that. Okay, next, um, it looks like there is an increase over time in the expression of extracellular proteases in the rhizosphere. 
and I, I think that the increase itself is bigger in the presence of litter, but feel free to disagree with me on that. All right, so those were the general trends of extracellular protease expression. Now let's dig, dig a little deeper into those extracellular proteases. So there are a bunch of different types of extracellular proteases, and that study that I mentioned that was looking at extracellular proteases in bacteria that was published last year by Nguyen et al. was looking at different types of them. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, what they were showing was when you look at genomes of bacteria and how many copies of extracellular proteases do they carry, most of the bacteria from environmental sources like soil and aquatic systems carry mostly metallopeptidases, followed by serine peptidases and cysteine peptidases in order of abundance. So I figured I might as well look at what I'm seeing in my system. And I was surprised to see that when you look at the expression of extracellular proteases, there actually is higher expression of serine peptidases followed by metallopeptidases. So there's a switch in the order compared to the number of genes per genome. And you could explain it by, you know, expression is not the same as having that genomic potential. Um, but I figured I'd dig a little deeper and think about this. Um, so I looked into the supplemental material in that really great paper. And I noticed that they had distributions of different types of extracellular proteases not just by phylum, but also by class. And what became apparent was that beta proteobacteria are actually enriched in these serine peptidases. Beta proteobacteria are very common um, rhizosphere organisms. And so I would expect to find enrichment or more higher expression of serine peptidases in the rhizosphere. However, I'm actually not seeing a difference between rhizosphere and bulk soil, which was once again confusing to me. So I looked at which organisms do I see a lot in soil here? And I'm seeing a lot of uh, streptomyces. And these guys, when you look at, once again, the Nguyen paper, are also enriched in serine peptidases and they're common in bulk soil. So what I think is happening is that the microbial community composition is actually causing that switch in um, abundance of gene transcripts of these extracellular proteases. Now, one other option that is very speculative, but I think is worth mentioning is that metallopeptidases in their active site require zinc. And we do know that there are some soils, some even grassland soils that are zinc deficient. So it's possible that expression of serin peptidases is ramped up compared to metallopeptidases because there's just not enough zinc. Okay, so far I've mostly talked to you about that bird's eye view of looking at all the assembled ORFs. Now I wanna go into differential expression and I'm gonna look at these extracellular proteases and which genomes are differentially expressing them. So here's a heat map that is similar to what you saw previously with casimes. So we have uh, the heat map represents log differential expression. We have the time series on the bottom. We have the three groups compared to bulk soil no litter on the top. And each row represents a genome in our meta-meta genome. And based on hierarchical clustering, I'm seeing several guilds here. Some of them are actually similar to the ones that were found with casimes, like the detritosphere guild. So this is, these are bugs that are upregulating expression of extracellular proteases in the presence of litter. We have a rhizosphere guild, um, which is upregulating expression of extracellular proteases in the presence of roots. We have the aging root. So um, these are bacteria that are responding to 
senescing of the root and using it as potentially a nitrogen source. And then we have two gills that I didn't see before. Uh, one of them I've temporarily named detrizo because these are bugs that are upregulating extracellular protein expression in the presence of both roots and um, litter. So detritus and rhizosphere. And finally, I have these bugs that I'm calling N hunters or nitrogen hunters. So these are once again, like the detrizo guild, expressing extracellular nitrogen, um, sorry, extracellular proteases in the presence of roots and litter. And they're increasing that expression over time. And that's interesting because we think that again, over time, the rhizosphere becomes more and more nitrogen limited. So these are the guys that are potentially then turning to other nitrogen sources like proteins and chitin and are mineralizing them, which could potentially benefit the plant. Um, so we have the N hunters and I know it looks like it's just one organism, but first of all, this is a sum of a bunch of different extracellular proteases that appear in this genome. There are 16 in this genome alone. And then secondly, we're mapping our transcripts at 80% similarity, which means that each one of these rows actually represents more of a cloud of bacteria, similar bacteria or close relatives. All right, so I was intrigued by these N hunters and I figured let's take another look at the Casime information and see what they look like there. So in Dr. Nuccio's paper, these bugs, the same um, genomic bin was clustered into the rhizosphere clade or guild. But if you look at its expression pattern, it increases over time in the rhizosphere in the presence of litter, just like with extracellular proteases. So what we think is happening is that these bugs are growing under these conditions so obviously they need a carbon source, which they're getting via their casimes, but they also need nitrogen to grow, which is what they get with extracellular proteases. And I think it also means that they're using the litter as a nitrogen source, as opposed to the other bugs, which seem to be kind of tapering off as the rhizosphere ages. So there is a functional redundancy here and a switch in the active, growing microbes over time in the rhizosphere. Okay. So who are these N hunters? I told you, so, or I didn't tell you, but if you have really good eyesight, you can see that this bin is just named Burkholder Yalis. Um, but it is actually a genome, so we can throw it onto a phylogenomic tree and see what it actually might be. So I did this two ways, one with GTDBTK and also by just constructing a phylogenomic tree of beta proteobacteria with references from RefSeq um, using G2 tree. And in both cases, this genomic bin was most closely related to a rhizobacter. So it, I'm gonna call it rhizobacter now. So let's look into this rhizobacter and see what else it can do as far as nitrogen cycling. Going back to the same differential expression uh, representation, we have the three groups, we have the time series on the bottom, and then we have nitrogen cycling genes um, per row. And then on the right, you have which pathways they belong to. So we see some nitrate reduction, assimilatory nitrate reduction. We see some uh, ammonia assimilation versus both, not versus, sorry, via uh, glutamate dehydrogenase and GSGO gap pathways. We see that regulatory pathway that responds to nitrogen limitation ramping up in the last time point of the rhizosphere which again sits pretty well with the fact that 
or not the fact, but the thought that the rhizosphere might become nitrogen limited towards the end of its life. And then finally, we also see upregulation of ammonium transporters. So let's wrap this up and look at what we've seen today. First of all, we were trying to figure out if there is um, there are nitrogen gene expression um, patterns. And the answer is yes, we see differences between rhizosphere and bulk soil. And we also see an effect of litter if you think about those extracellular proteases, for example which nitrogen cycling pathways were highly expressed. We were looking at extracellular proteases, which was highest in bulk soil without litter, and then archaeal nitrification. And we also saw some um, ammonium assimilation. Now, how does the expression of nitrogen cycling pathways change in the presence of detritus when you think about the extracellular proteins, for example, um, the presence of detritus actually reduced their expression. Then we were trying to figure out, do we have functional guilds like we saw with Kazime expressions with these extracellular proteases? And the answer is absolutely yes. We see these guilds. The membership of these guilds overlaps pretty well with the membership in Kazime guilds. The gills that we found were rhizosphere, detritosphere, and aging root, which were also identified by chasms. And in addition to that, we had the detrizo guild and the N hunters. And when we dig into that, we saw that the um, exoprotease guild overlaps in membership again with that rhizosphere guild. Um, Sorry, the exoprotease rhizosphere guild overlaps in membership with the chasm rhizosphere guild, and that these N hunters were increasing extracell extracellular protease expression over time in the rhizosphere with litter, that it's probably a rhizobacter, um, and then it's doing a bunch of uh, assimilatory nitrogen pathways. Uh, sorry, here is my uh, token pet. This is Biscuit. Right, this has to happen sometime when you're, at some point when you're um, zooming a uh, talk. So I would like to thank, first of all, my advisor, Mary Firestone, um, my main collaborator, Jennifer Petridge from the Livermore National Lab. Of course, Dr. Erin Nuccio, who was very gracious in providing me this data set and is also helping with the paper. Um, and there were a lot of people in both Mary Firestone and Jill Banfield's lab who helped me out with feedback. Um, this work was funded by the Department of Energy. We also got a lot of help from the Joint Genome Institute, um, both for sequencing and for single cell genomics. Um, I'd like to thank the people who were involved in creating that meta-meta genome that we were mapping to, Owen Brody and Ulush Karaus. And then finally, I want to very quickly pitch um, the Bioinformatics Virtual Coordination Network. This is an initiative started by ben Tully, Dr. Bentali from USC. And we're basically providing free bioinformatics online classes to anyone who wants to join. Um, we're currently funded by the Moore Foundation. You can find us on GitHub, Twitter, and YouTube. So if you or your colleagues or your friends or your students are getting into bioinformatics and would like to learn R, Python, basic Unix, metagenomics, functional annotation, and many more, um, please find us and join us. Uh, and with that, I'll take questions. Thank you so much for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Ella. That was wonderful. Um, a lot of really interesting threads to follow up on it in that in that talk. Um, we have uh, we have one question that's come in already over over uh, over the chat. Um, and for those of you who are watching, if you do have questions, just just a reminder to enter them into the into the stream chat box. 
I know in the past we've sometimes missed your questions. I think it has to do with latency. So I'm going to wait a little bit this time before signing off. Um, but uh, one question from Kiking uh, Zhao seems like uh, you missed some key gene transcripts you wanted. How about the sequencing depth? Could this just be uh, random results due to low coverage? No, these were pretty deeply sequenced metatranscriptomes. I don't think we're missing anything due to coverage. I think that it's just biologically the way the system works. Yeah. So yeah, I I, I might have missed that, but how, like when when you're doing this type of thing, like thinking about like sequencing depth, how many how many samples per lane, or how many you know are using NovaSeq or using iSeq? Like what are the like how are you how are you guys parameterizing that nowadays we use NovaSeq, but this was sequenced a couple years ago so probably high seek yeah and um to the best of my uh swiss cheese memory we're we're talking about roughly t 10 to 20 gigs per sample okay but i i can go into, so this is all um it should be in Dr. Nuccia's paper and in um, Dr. Starr's papers already. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know that that's a that's something that's out there. I just didn't know when when. So so these days, when you guys are doing like a no, do you do like one sample per NovaSeq run, or are you are you putting oh, a no. bunch of them on there? Or, <laughs> I, I wish. don't know how deep <laughs> some people some people go real deep with sediments. I know. So I I don't know uh, what what you guys are thinking at this point. Yeah, I would say, I think the latest that we've done, we were going for shallow sequencing was 100 samples per NovaSeq lane, but that was specifically okay. for shallow sequencing. Sure. Okay, okay. And like, I, yeah, okay. I'm just curious about these things mm -hmm. thinking, thinking forward. Um, okay, question from Joe James. Uh, I'm curious about the NERK AMOA and Archaea or NERK plus AMOA and Archaea. I found similar results in Lake Waters. Can you expound on the the NERK a bit more or refer me to the article please. Yeah absolutely so this is uh, an exciting kind of new discovery for me as well. Um, oh sorry I got a message from Aaron Nuccio about the sequencing depth. <laughs> oh wow this is super meta. <laughs> uh, I know right and she's saying um, we're looking at 45 million mRNA reads per sample. Okay. Okay. Great. So, uh, Thanks, Aaron. right. Going back to the NERK story, uh, that was super exciting for me as well because um, I was totally unaware of this. Apparently, it's only come up in the last, I want to say, five, six years. And uh, one of the main papers that I can think of off the top of my head talking about this was by Paul Carini. Um, and he, I think, surveyed public, publicly available AOA genomes. Um, and they all were really missing that hydroxylamine oxidoreductase and they had an analog to NERK. It's not really NERK. Um, I know that there have been a bunch of studies trying to figure out if there is actually hydroxylamine oxidation in archaea and the answer is yes, but we don't know what's doing it. Um, and then there sometimes is nitric oxide or nitrous oxide even production by AOA, but I think, again, this I read this a while ago, but not under any condition. Mm -hmm. So I'd start with Paul Carini's paper and there have been a bunch published since. Cool. Yeah, I, I know that there, the nitrous oxide story is big in, in the oceans, but I wonder if it's something that's happening in the soils, right? I mean, it seems these, yeah, these, it is. these AOAs are like, these like they've been hiding under the radar this whole time. <laughs> it's slowly just like, oh, guess who's guess who's who's here and responsible for ammonification or nitrification. Um, uh, I I have a little bit of a follow up on that. I, I don't I are how similar are the AOAs in that are doing ammonia oxidation in in soil and marine systems? Are they like are they really phylogenetically divergent? Are they sister clades? Are like what like like is it just a? Is it just that they seem to have the same metabolic suite and everything else is different? They're definitely different clades phylogenetically. Uh, I know there's a soil clade. Yeah. And um, they're different 
from what I've seen, different species. So in soil, we're talking mainly nitrosphera. That's what I'm seeing. And nitroso -cos cosmicus, I think it's called. Okay. And then in, in marine systems, you see, um, I'm trying to remember. Oh my gosh. I was in the lab that actually published one of these, but. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Nitrosopelagicus. Nitrosa marinus. They, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Right on. Okay. So so they're all sort of, yeah, it's a different genre at least. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Another, let's see. Uh, oh, this is a follow-up on your on your bioinformatics training question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, from Marco Mitchin, um, great presentation. Congrats. How can we get access to the online training? It's freely available on YouTube. So if you just Google BVCN or look up BVCN on YouTube, you can access all of our videos. If you'd like to join the network, we have a Slack channel. So um, yeah, I didn't put a link here, but there's just a short survey that you have to fill out about what's your like general, how do you perceive your general level of bioinformatics? It's on Twitter. Um, if you look up Ben Tolley, I think his handle is phantom bugs. Yes. Um, and you can also Google BVCN GitHub and you can, and we have a wiki page and it probably has an, uh, access to the survey as well. Please join Great. us. Great. I think that's wonderful. You guys are doing that. What a wonderful use of time and, and a way to like, you know, enrich the community while everyone's stuck in front of their computers. Okay. Uh, question from Aaron Eggleston. Um, Thanks for a nice talk. You didn't find in fixation transcripts, correct? Do you yeah. have ideas about why you don't see them? Do you think in limitation is just being addressed by degradation of larger in compounds? That's a really good question. And I was surprised not to find any nitrogen fixation. Um, I, I, even though this is not a legume and it's not, you know, something that's classically a plant that's classically associated with nitrogen fixing bacteria. I would have expected something. Um, I guess I have two guesses about this. One is that yes, there is enough um, macromolecular nitrogen out there to support the community. And the other is, so this plant is, can be associated with arbuscular mycorrhizal fung fungi or AMF, which are pretty good at uh, getting nitrogen to the plant, better than bacteria anyway. So um, there might just not be a driver of nitrogen fixation because of that. Nice. Do you guys do you guys discard bioinformatically eukaryotic like sequences, or is that something you could go back in and mine potentially? We don't discard eukaryotic sequences. So in fact, the paper on the RNA viruses was also looking at um, potential eukaryotic hosts within the same uh, metatranscriptomes. Uh, they're not very abundant. So usually your main eukaryotes in soil would be fungi, especially, but this is sieved soil. So we, we'd get rid of the bigger things, but also when you sieve soil, which is something that I learned in this lab, um, you're breaking down fungal hyphae, which means they're at a disadvantage right at the get-go of this experiment. Okay, so there's some sampling, um, you know, methodology behind why you won't see a lot of fungi in, in, yeah. this, in this data set. Okay, great, that's awesome. Okay, well, I think um, I don't see any additional questions online and it's 10 o'clock anyway, at least over here on the West Coast. So thank you everybody for your attention and, and thank you, uh, Ella, for a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate your contribution to MicroSeminar this week. Thank you. Okay, see you guys all in a week or so.